Hello. Hello. Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. Today we're here to talk about the often overlooked legacy of Dorothy Malone so that all in all we can get a better picture on what her impact in classic films consisted of. Normally when Dorothy Malone is discussed two distinctive performances are brought up the ones in The Big Sleep and also in Written on the Wind for which she won an Oscar for Best Supporting Actress. But what is not so frequently discussed is her participation in film noir. So that's what this video is for, taking a closer look at some of her most remembered performances, but also to showcase several lesser known noirs in which Dorothy Malone participated. And although she didn't often get the best parts in them, they offer a neat perspective on her absolute affinity for noir and for playing characters with a unique dramatic voice, showing remarkable versatility very early on in her career, Dorothy Maloney, later changed to Malone, was first scouted by an RKO executive while she was still in college. Although she signed a contract with the studio in the early 1940s, it wasn't until she moved on to Warner Brothers where she got her first big break with the now iconic The Big Sleep. She appears in only one scene, but that scene alone as an Acme bookstore proprietress, changing her specs for a rainy afternoon with Humphrey Bogart was sizzling enough to put her on the map and be singled out by audiences and critics. I see. It began to interest me, vaguely. Yeah. Despite this incredible leap forward, good parts for Dorothy were still scarce. After a few roles in westerns, she was constantly cast as the good girl next door who stood beside the conflicted hero of the story. That is exactly what we find in the gangster noir Flaxy Martin, released in 1949 and starring Virginia Mayo as the femme fatale and Zachary Scott and Elijah Cook Jr. in a supporting role. In this film, Malone was given a a fairly substantial role as Nora Carson, the woman who saves and takes care of the escaped, wrongfully convicted Walter Colby, played by Zachary. Although it is very entertaining, the film failed to be the success for Warner Brothers that The Big Sleep had been, but still it is a gripping, well-crafted film with wonderful cinematography by Carl Guthrie. For Dorothy, it meant that if she wanted to get ahead, she needed to make a move. And so, finishing her contract with Warner Warner Brothers, Dorothy turned to freelancing and she appeared a year later in a Columbia noir convicted along with Glenn Ford and Brother Crawford. In it, she plays good-natured Kay Noland, daughter of Crawford's George Noland, the district attorney who later becomes a prison warden. This time again, she falls in love with Joe Hufford, played by Ford, convicted of manslaughter for killing a man in self-defense. Directed by Henry Levin, this isn't again the greatest of noirs and Dorothy was still playing second fiddle to more prominent names but it has enough solid performances and script for a worthy noir session. In the same vein Dorothy had a minor appearance in another Colombian noir The Killer That Stalked New York, also released in 1950. Extremely timely during COVID days, the killer is none other than a smallpox outbreak and the film follows its carrier slash diamond smuggler, Sheila Bennett, played by Evelyn Keyes, incessantly sought after by authorities and health department officials. Malone plays a small part as clinic nurse Alice Laurie in an ensemble cast that also featured William Bishop, Charles Gordon, Lola Albright, Jim Backus, or Richard Egan in a very early role. Malone, no matter the size or even nature of her part, always provided a bright grounding quality that made all her characters believable and also singularly lovable. This is a noir shot in a semi-documentary style with cinematography by Joseph Byrock, and it is one of those noir rarities that despite its flaws, is still very much an exciting watch. And from that small stint, we jump right into 1954, one of the busiest years in Dorothy Malone's career, in which she participated in not one, not two, but in four fascinating and distinct noir efforts. 1954 would also be the year when Dorothy would undergo a simple yet significant change in her appearance, transform 
transforming her natural hair color into her signature blonde. It is amazing to think how hair color can have such a transformational impact, thinking also of cases like Lucille Ball. In Dorothy's case, it meant that finally producers were opening their eyes to her full potential, her sexiness, and to the fact that she could play broader variety of parts than the ones she had been persistently offered. But that would still take a couple of years. Within her typecasting as the understanding wife or girlfriend, one of her best parts was in Loophole, a crime drama directed by Harold Schuster, a highly regarded film editor who later became a director. Loophole is told in sort of a true crime fashion and it tells the story of Mike Donovan, played by Barry Sullivan, a bank teller who gets framed for a nearly $50,000 embezzlement. Malone plays his wife Ruth and it also stars Charles McGraw, always a welcome presence, as the insurance company investigator hounding Sullivan for a confession. This film has wonderful pacing and despite being a low-budget production, it is gripping and taut. Malone is great and instrumental in helping her not-so-dependable husband resolve their tough predicament. Dorothy's next film was Pushover, another Columbia production and a starring vehicle for Kim Novak in her first credited and protagonist role. Directed by Richard Quine, the film also featured Frank McMurray, who is not often credited enough for his versatility and who was then fresh from his success playing a villainous role in The Great The Kane Mutiny and great supporting actors including E.G. Marshall and Phil Carey. The story of Pushover has been referred to as a facsimile of McMurray's great double indemnity because at large his character undergoes a similar path than the one in Billy Wilder's iconic noir classic. The twist here resides in adding the voyeuristic component which was also present in two other films released in 1954, most famously in Hitchcock's Rear Window but also in Witness to Murder, a noir I talked about in a recent video devoted to four lesser-known Barbara Stanwyck noir gems. In Pushover, Dorothy plays a nurse again, Anne Stewart, the apartment neighbor of Lona McLean, played by Novak, incidentally the girlfriend of a bank robber whom the police is trying to locate. By befriending Lona and putting her under surveillance, Fred's character, a police detective, finds himself again with a deadly proposition with awry repercussions. He is accompanied by another police officer played by Carrie who is interested in Malone's character but has no clue of his partner's plans. Pushover is another well-crafted noir that definitely needs more recognition. Novak was already a deserved success and the film got good reviews for the whole cast. Her third noir of 1954 was Private Health 36. Curiously, another film that dealt with banks or with an unresolved bank robbery and with cops being tempted into criminality. In this tense and hard-edged noir, written by Ida Lupino and Collier Young, we follow two police detectives, played by Howard Duff and Steve Cochran, trailing the money of a big New York heist that hasn't been solved yet. Their investigations lead them to Ida Lupino's character, nightclub singer Lily Marlowe, and through her they find the robber and also the stolen money, but that brings further complications as Cochrane's character wants to snatch a portion of the loot and convinces Howard Dove's character to keep his mouth shut. The repercussions of this act and how it affects the two main relationships of this film, the one with Ida Lupino and Steve Cochrane and Howard Dove and his wife Francie played by Dorothy Malone, is what the film focuses on. Also in the cast we have Dean Jagger as their chief, Captain Michaels, and as a curiosity, Howard Dove's daughter in the film is played by his own daughter and also Ida Lupino's daughter Bridget. The crew of Private Health 36 also holds another surprise as we find in the credits the name of none other than Sam Peckinpah as David Peckinpah at the request 
of Don Siegel who directed this film and who had already collaborated with Peckinpah in another film released in 1954 called Riot in Cell Block 11. Either herself, besides her acting and writing credits, she was also the producer of this film. With her ex-husband Collier Young through her production company The Filmmakers, she was also initially going to direct this film but due to strains in her marriage to Howard Duff at the time it was filmed, she decided to appoint Siegel instead. Private Hell 36 is another solid tale of greed and the push and pull between duty and desire. Unfortunately, it opened to quite mediocre reviews. And Dorothy's performance once again is a minor one, but it is also fair to say that within the industry, as her busy schedule at the time confirms, she was a well-respected actress and highly sought after by up-and-coming directors as well as established ones. The next and most unusual entry of this video comes with the film The Fast and the Furious, a popular title today because of the Fast and Furious action film franchise, but that by 1954 it was a title attached to Roger Corman, who wrote the story upon which this noir-tinted racing car thriller is based. It is quite difficult to classify a movie like The Fast and the Furious as it was a bit of a hybrid and also quite a novelty. Speaking about its plot, the film starts off with the character of Constance Adair, portrayed by Dorothy Malone, playing a race car driver who is bound to participate in a cross-border car race, who finds herself embroiled in an altercation when John Ireland's character, Frank Webster, takes her hostage. He plays a wrongly convicted truck driver who escapes from prison and wants desperately to cross the border to Mexico. At a small coffee shop, he meets Dorothy's character and another unwelcome guest who becomes suspicious of him. That is when Frank tries to make a run for it and takes Connie and her beautiful Jaguar along. By no means a damsel in distress, Dorothy's character is the smarter person in the room, an ace driver, and makes John's character question his choices and trajectory as they move along. You can certainly tell that The Fast and the Furious is a low-budget film, but there is something fresh and fascinating about it that also anticipates Dorothy's next big and definitive acting break in Written on the Wind. The Fast and the Furious was the first film distributed by American Releasing Corporation, which would soon expand to become American International Pictures. It was produced by Corman's Palo Alto Productions to a moderate box office success, but still one that granted Corman a three-movie deal starting to direct his own films. This one though was co-directed by its male star John Ireland as a racing car chase and hostage thriller The Fast and the Furious remains an interesting watch easily paired with other noir tinted unique films like Robert Mitchum's Thunder Road or John Sturge's Jeopardy which I discussed in the recent video I mentioned dedicated to Barbara Stanwyck and from that we jump from a jaguar to a beautiful red woodill wildfire to remember Dorothy's most acclaimed performance in the masterpiece that is Written on the Wind, directed by Douglas Sirk and released in 1956. I'll wait. And I'll have marriage or no marriage. In a gorgeous ensemble cast, including Robert Stack, who should have also won an Oscar for his performance, Rock Hudson and Lauren Bacall. Dorothy's flamboyant sultriness and own personal mix of sadness, malice and unstoppable drive granted her an Oscar and recognition from peers, critics and audiences. Her character construction is not only conveyed through Dorothy Malone's exceptional performance, but also through the meticulous attention to detail in elements such as her clothes, her car, and the settings that surround her. Cirque's artistic vision revealed hidden aspects of the story and enriched the film's narrative and especially Merrily Hadley by providing subtle and not so subtle cues through art 
direction, set decoration, and costume design. The German filmmaker explored and exploited practically all the resources of film language to create in Written on the Wind an atmosphere of a lush Greek tragedy and twisted family dynamics right in the heart of America. Even if this film is not considered film noir, still we find many reminiscent elements and certainly in Merrily a great example of the sultry, conniving and treacherous femme fatale archetype. I can talk you right into the state penitentiary. You are sick, Mary Lee. Your sickness won't be cured by marrying me. Of her talent, Douglas Sirk said, She has earthiness, depth and power, and she handles emotions beautifully. She has proved her ability to play routine sweet girl characters, and now, in this offbeat, sexy role, she is simply great. Yeah, I see what you mean. Dorothy had gone up to that point fairly unnoticed by the press as she rarely played the Hollywood game, gave few interviews and would often return to her native home in Dallas. Partly also why her career took so long to fully take off. However, her collaborations with Douglas Sirk in Written on the Wind and later in The Tarnished Angels, reuniting again part of the cast of Written on the Wind, put her on the map for a versatility and an ability to play troubled women that had been up to that point disregarded by typecasting. Following her performance in Battle Cry, directed by Raoul Walsh and released a year prior to Written on the Wind, Dorothy continued this path of giving voice to troubled fallen women. From this moment on, Malone's film career progression was definitely uneven. It certainly couldn't have been easy portraying women who challenged the expected female etiquette of the 1950s, particularly concerning topics such as sex and complex family dynamics. She had wonderful acting opportunities such as Robert Aldrich's The Last Sunset, released in 1961 with a screenplay by Dalton Trumbo, and being paired again with Rock Hudson, and this time accompanied with Kirk Douglas, Joseph Cotton, and Carol Lindley too. She had a leading powerful role in it. Don't you see, Brianna? I don't want to be loved as if I were a, a frightened, shivering, innocent little girl. I have to be loved for what I am. I'm a woman. And also a supporting role in another Western, a genre she contributed to a lot as well, called Warlock, directed by Edward Dimitrik, released in 1959, and starring Henry Fonda, Richard Whitmark, Anthony Queen, and Dolores Michaels, in another great ensemble cast. But she also appeared in the controversial Too Much Too Soon by Art Napoleon, released in 1958, an adaptation of Diana Bar Barrymore's memoirs, Dorothy and Errol Flynn playing John Barrymore, father of Diana, were amazing in it, but the film as a whole was not the success everyone expected. But just as cinema seemed to be closing the doors for Dorothy, television opened a new window by casting her in the popular melodrama TV series Peyton Place, experiencing a remarkable upswing in her career. Aside from television, there are two small and noir-tinted performances of Dorothy in film that I'd like to leave you with. The first comes with The Forgotten Winter Kills, a film written and directed by William Richard, released in 1979 and remembered for its troubled production. This was a satirical political comedy slash thriller with another impressive and quite large ensemble cast with the likes of Jeff Bridges, John Huston, Anthony Perkins, Eli Wallach, Toshiro Mifune, Sterling Hayden, Ralph Meeker, Elizabeth Taylor, or Brad Dexter. In it, Dorothy plays a bit part as Emma Keegan, the mother of the protagonist played by Jeff Bridges and wife to John Huston in the film. And of course, lastly, I have to mention her surprise but fitting cameo in the neo-noir erotic thriller that is Basic Instinct and directed by Paul Verhoeven. Dorothy has but a couple of lines in it but her appearance is definitely symbolic and a nod to her most remembered acting creation.
Revelations and also a tribute and a testament once again to her wonderful portrayal, especially in the 1950s, of, in Dorothy's own words, full-blown women with conflicts and guilt, but trying to break out of their shell in a time when that was truly difficult. And talking about surprise cameos, I would like to thank Carl Sweeney from the Movie Palace podcast for his wonderful voiceover in this video and for talking last year in his show about Written on the Wind. This is a friendly reminder to listen to his great podcast over on all the usual platforms discussing great films with fantastic guests. And so on that note, I'm going to end the video dedicated to Dorothy Malone here. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate your being here and until next time, all the best and have a wonderful day. Goodbye, shooter.